Hey guys, my name is Matt Johnson, and today I'm excited to share with you that I'm gonna be putting together an $850-ish video editing computer, and I want you to come along with me while I do it. Now that I say that, that sounds really nerdy. In my opinion, this computer build offers some of the lowest price for the highest performance that you can get for your dollar. So if you've been considering building an editing computer, I hope this video is helpful to you. In this video, I'm gonna show you all the parts that I bought for this computer. And I'm gonna explain to you the pros and cons and why I bought each of these parts. And then I'm gonna take all the parts, take them out of their boxes and show you how to put them together into a computer. And once I've done that, I'm gonna hit the power button and hopefully it will turn on. So regardless of wherever you fall on the spectrum of nerdery, whether you were at the total top, like Matt, I built like 10 computers now, I know what I'm doing, PC gaming master race for life, all that sort of stuff, then hopefully this video will still be entertaining to you because hey, I'm gonna show you some parts and why I bought them. But if you are completely new to this, if you've never built an editing computer, but you're thinking about doing it because honestly, you can save a lot of money and get a ton of power if you build your own editing computer, then I hope this video will help you too because I'm gonna show you exactly how to put together the computer. So it's honestly kinda like Legos, it's not that hard to put together. Now at this point you're probably wondering, Matt, why are you putting together a video editing computer? Because if you've watched any of my live streams, you would know that last year I put together an awesome video editing beast of a computer that I use every day and that I still love. Well, this new video editing computer is actually not for me. It's for my brother who called me up and said, hey Matt, I have a budget of about $800 to $900. Can you put together a video editing computer for me? Also, I want to play Battlefield and other video games. And I said, oh, okay, cool. Well, then I can do that for you. There is one last thing that I want to address before I jump into all the computer parts that I'm gonna be using for this build, and that is that I would greatly prefer if the comment section did not turn into a massive Mac versus PC debate. Now, I realize that I'm in the minority as a video editor that uses a PC, but that said, there are two things that PCs really have going for them over Macs, in my opinion. Namely, I like to play video games, and you cannot play video games nearly as well on a Mac as you can on a PC. Secondly, I believe that the price to power ratio is gonna be better if you buy a PC than if you buy a Mac. Namely, if you had the same amount of money to spend on a PC and the same amount of money to spend on a Mac, you would get a more powerful PC for the cost. It's just how it works and the way that Apple is charging for their computers. That said, you are giving up something really big whenever you build a PC over buying a Mac. Namely, with a Mac, if you have any issues at all with it, you're confused about something, something breaks, something's acting weird, you have the Apple Store. You can take the Mac in the Apple Store and say, help, it's broken, help me fix it, and they will do that for you. If you have built your own PC and there's an issue, you gotta diagnose that on your own. You're the one that's gonna have to fix that. So as a person that likes to tinker on PCs, as a person that enjoys building computers and messing with them, if that does not intrigue you, maybe a Mac would be a better choice for you. You're gonna pay more for it, but you are gonna get that ease of mind of saying, hey, I can take this into the Apple Store if things break. Regardless, final thing to say, if you are editing on Adobe Premiere, whenever you click on the program, whether you are on a PC or a Mac, it is gonna open up the exact same program with the exact same interface. It's gonna edit videos the same. It's gonna render videos the same. It is going to make the same videos. And none of your clients are gonna ask you, hey, how did you edit this? Did you edit on a Mac or a PC? Because that doesn't matter. So don't get caught up into some big argument whenever at the end of the day, we're all making videos and what matters is the video that you make not the technology that you use to make it. <sighs> now with that little rant out of the way, let's talk about some parts. All right, parts. This is the fun part, guys. I have the case here. I have other parts that I bought from Newegg and Amazon. Please be aware that these parts are not the absolute dirt cheapest parts that you can buy. I bought these parts specifically tailored for my brother, so I do believe that you could get this PC down cheaper. I spent around $850 on this build. I think that you could get it down to the mid 600s if you made a few changes. So I will address that as I go through the parts. You notice here that I've not actually opened anything yet and the reason is because my opening process was pretty funny and I'm gonna try to recreate it here for you guys. So we will cover this in a second. This is the case, it's cool. I will talk about it in a moment. For now, let's open up the new egg box here and see what we got. So this is how I felt whenever I first opened up the box because the first thing that you see whenever you open up the box is this card and it's an ad for Harry's, which I'm not sponsored by in any way, but I just thought it was really, really funny because me with this, uh, the last thing I need is an ad for a shaving company. So we're, uh, we're done with that. I meant to like throw it off somewhere. 
I'm not good at getting rid of things. What are we gonna talk about first here? Let's start with the processor. This is the Ryzen 5 1400 processor. So it has four cores and eight threads at 3.2 gigahertz. And those eight threads are one of the most important factors to consider whenever you are buying a CPU because the more threads that you have, the faster your rendering and editing process is going to be. If you are doing gaming, having multi-threads is not as important because a lot of games only use one thread. But if you are doing video editing, video editing software such as Adobe Premiere is one of the softwares that takes advantage of having multiple threads. So the more threads you have, the better. So that is gonna make your renders quicker, it's gonna make your editing quicker, and this processor, the Ryzen 5 1400, is one of the best bangs for your buck in terms of price to performance. It is unreal. Because up until about three months ago, if you asked me what processor should I buy, I would never have said AMD. I would have been like, no, don't touch AMD. AMD is horrible. Buy Intel. AMD is so far behind. That all changed when AMD announced Ryzen, which completely changed the entire playing field. Whereas before Intel was charging a lot of money for chips, AMD came in and said, hey, we're gonna cut all these prices in half or more, and you're gonna get a ton of power for a cheap price. So this processor right here cost me $164. If you wanted to buy a roughly equivalent processor from Intel, you would be looking at around 300 bucks. You are getting a lot of power for a smaller price. So if you are considering building a video editing PC, look at AMD very closely, because I think that in terms of processor power, cores available and threads, this is an amazing processor. The Ryzen 5 is as cheap as I would go. They also have the Ryzen 3, which is cheaper and lower powered. And while that may sound good because, hey, price to performance here, it is a good chip, but you are only getting four threads of performance, not eight like you're getting with this chip. So spend the $160 and buy one of the Ryzen 5 1400 processors if you're looking for a good budget processor. That said, if you have more money, I would definitely look at the Ryzen 6 1600 because what that is going to give you is six cores and 12 threads of performance which is going to make your video edit significantly faster especially if you are editing 4k the last thing that i'll say about this processor that's very beneficial is that it comes with a cooler so you do not need to go out and buy another cooler from what i've read this cooler works very well especially if you're not doing heavy overclocking of your computer so if you want a good processor and a good cooler all in one for 164 bucks this is a good choice. I'm a big fan of the 1400 and I'm excited to see how it performs. All right, what else we got in here? Let's go with the motherboard next. This is the Asus Strix B350 motherboard and it has RGB, which honestly makes any motherboard cooler, just being honest here. If you watch Linus Tech Tips, you'll know. I'm a big fan of this motherboard, especially for the price, and I believe that it offers a lot of features that you see in their higher-end motherboards, but for cheaper. So benefits of this coming in at about $105 is that you are getting four USB 3.0 ports and two USB 3.1 ports. That is incredibly helpful if you are doing video editing because if you're like me, you're gonna be using external hard drives. And so you're gonna be plugging a lot of hard drives in, editing off of them, backing up things, copying things. Half my life at this point is spent copying footage. So anything that I can do to speed up that process by having fast ports is beneficial. So I think it's gonna help with my brother a lot whenever he is doing his video editing. This motherboard also has an M.2 slot, which means you can attach an M.2 form factor SSD directly to the motherboard. More on that in a minute. Lastly, this motherboard also has room to grow. So if my brother wants to add more memory in the future or another graphics card, this motherboard has the slots and capability to do that. The one con of this motherboard is that it does not support Thunderbolt. Reason being that Intel, AMD's main competitor, is currently the one that is developing and pushing Thunderbolt. So of course they're not gonna allow one of their competitors to use it in their systems. I have read that this may change in the future, but for now you are limited to USB 3.0 and 3.1, which in my experience is still really, really fast and very usable. Up next, we have the hard drive. This is a Samsung 850 Evo solid state drive in the M.2 form factor. And the cool thing about it is that it attaches directly to the motherboard. So in theory, you'll get a faster connection. The issue and what I did wrong is that if I could have gone back and spent $30 more, I would have bought a Samsung 960 Pro SSD, and that would result in significantly faster speeds. After I make this video, I may actually end up returning this guy and putting the faster solid state drive in this computer for a little bit more money because it's gonna be significantly faster. But that said, 
Any SSD is gonna be significantly faster than a hard drive and it's gonna be a good decision for you. Let's get on to the fun stuff now that I'm sure you guys really wanna see. Namely, the graphics card. Honestly, it, doesn't everybody love graphics cards? This is probably my favorite part too. I love graphics cards. This is the EVGA Superclocked GeForce GTX 1060 with six gigabytes of VRAM. Very important here. They sell another one that only has three that's cheaper, but if you are doing video editing, especially in 4K, having those six gigabytes is gonna be significantly better for you. That said, this graphics card is definitely not the cheapest graphics card that you could buy for your system. There are two reasons though that I bought this graphics card. The first and the practical one is because it has more CUDA cores, which is NVIDIA's primary computing unit that they put in this thing. All that I know is that it makes your editing and rendering faster whenever you are video editing. So more CUDA cores, better for editing. The second reason that I bought this graphics card and the one that is definitely not as important for video editing is that I bought this graphics card for its game playing ability. Namely, the 1060 is a pretty beastly card and you can run most games in Ultra at 1080p just fine, which is my brother's main usage scenario. He's not even playing 4K games, he doesn't really need a GTX 1080 Ti level of performance, but with this graphics card, he's gonna be able to play a lot of games at a very high frame rate, and it's gonna look really, really good. Now, I'm sure at this point, you're like, Matt, I do not need to play video games. I have no interest in doing that. I just wanna edit videos. Is there a way that I can save money in this build? Definitely. Whenever I first talked to my brother about this computer build, I had a GTX 1050 Ti in the cart, ready to buy it. And my brother said, well, I want extra graphical performance for games, and I was like, okay, fine, I will buy the GTX 1060, which is gonna give you more power in games. But whenever we are talking about video editing, the graphics card is not the most important part. Honestly, the CPU is significantly more important than the graphics card. So let's spend more money on the CPU and let's save some money on the graphics card. So instead of you needing to spend $289 on the GTX 1060, I would definitely recommend looking at the 1050 Ti, which you can buy for about 150 bucks. So if you're on a budget and you wanna save some money, get the 1050 Ti. You're gonna save over $100 on your build and it's still gonna be an amazing video editing experience and still really good at gaming too. You're gonna to be able to play a ton of games with that graphics card as well. I've said enough about the graphics card now. Over it. On to more important things. Well, honestly, the graphics card is really important, but let's talk about RAM. And RAM for Ryzen systems is a little bit weird. Namely, you'll notice a sticker it says compatible with Ryzen. There has been some issues that I've read about about certain RAM sticks not being compatible with the CPU of Ryzen and with the motherboard. So to compensate for that, AMD is now having stickers put on things compatible with Ryzen. This one's good. And that's something for you to keep your eye on whenever you are purchasing RAM. The other thing to consider whenever you're buying RAM, and honestly, this is the most annoying thing for me about whenever I am building a computer. That is, you need to keep an eye on what the manufacturer of the motherboard, in this case, Asus, recommends for RAM. So if you go on the Asus website for this motherboard, they will have a spreadsheet listing all of the different RAM that they have tested and they know that is compatible with the motherboard. And it is in your best interest in general to purchase RAM that is on that spreadsheet because that way you are not gonna be dealing with, hey, is this compatible? Is this not compatible? Is this working? You are less likely to have issues if you buy RAM that is on the compatibility list. In this case, this is G-Skill Fortis memory. And this is 16 gigs, so eight gigs per stick at 2400 megahertz RAM. I wish that it was faster. I wish this was 3200 megahertz. I wish it was a faster clock speed for the RAM. But the issue with that is that that's gonna be more expensive. So if my brother had more money in his budget, I definitely would have purchased 16 gigs of RAM at 3200 megahertz or at a faster clock speed in general. But RAM clock speed does not make a huge difference. So I'm not gonna stress about it. I think there's gonna be plenty of RAM and plenty fast, especially for 1080p and 4K editing. So to sum that up, this is good RAM from a reputable company with a lifetime warranty. I think the G-Skill is a great brand, and if you're looking for DDR4 RAM, this is a great choice. Got it? Okay, great. Last two things here. We have the power supply. This is the EVGA 600B bronze power supply. And what does that even mean? Honestly, people don't ever really think about power supplies. I know that I don't a ton, but the power supply is very important for your computer, especially in the long haul, because this power supply is what's gonna dictate how much money you spend on electricity in your house. So if you buy any of the power supplies that have the 80 plus 
rating of either bronze or silver or gold or platinum or it's like titanium, any of those metal rated power supplies are gonna have greater efficiency than a power supply that is not 80 plus rated. So whenever you're buying a power supply, look for that. As you can see, this power supply is of the bronze variety, which means it's on the cheaper side. I believe that it was $44 and then it also had a mail-in rebate. So it's gonna be in the mid thirties once I send that off and get the rebate. But I think that is a good price to pay for a power supply and good for the quality. That said, there is a con of this power supply. This is not a modular power supply. And what I mean by that is that power supplies that are modular, I have a little box, and then they have cables that you can actually plug into them. So you say, I need my motherboard cable, I need my graphics card cable, I need a cable for my hard drives. And you can plug those cables into the back of the power supply. If you have a non-modular power supply, all of those cables just come attached to the power supply. So that can be a little crazy because then you've got cables running everywhere and that can make it difficult to cable manage your case. Thankfully with this case, you do not need to worry about that because the power supply is actually hidden in a little compartment underneath. So it will not be visible even with all of your cables. Oh, and I guess I should talk about the actual power rating of this power supply. This is a 600 watt power supply, which is complete and total overkill for the graphics card and the motherboard and all the other components that I'm gonna be running through it. I probably could have bought a 450 watt power supply and would have had plenty of power to go around. That said, the difference in cost between a 450 watt power supply and a 600 watt power supply is quite negligible. So I wasn't stressing because I think it was like a $5 difference if that, it actually may have been cheaper for me to buy this one with the mail-in rebate. So I went with a slightly bigger one with the thought that maybe my brother will want to add a second graphics card in the future, or maybe he's gonna wanna change some things up and maybe he'll be running 20 external hard drives, all USB powered off the computer. I don't know, he may need more power. So I would rather go with the most power for my buck and I do not need to stress about him calling me one day being like, things are messed up, it's broken. That's another thing. Anything that I can do to minimize my brother calling me and being like, things are broken, help. The less that I have to do that, the more stable I can make this computer without issues, the better for me mentally and the better for my brother because he'll be able to get more work done. With that, let's talk about the computer case. Come on, it's pretty, it's cool. I'm excited to talk about this thing. This is the NZXT S340 mid tower computer case. And you notice here that it's actually purple and white on the sides, but I didn't buy a purple one. This is actually, if you look down here, this little blue color, it's actually blue and black, which should look really, really pretty with this whole setup. As I said, this is a mid tower case, so it's not gonna be stinking huge, but it should be the perfect size for all of these components with room to expand in the future. This case cost $65 on Newegg, but there was a 10 or $15 mail-in rebate. So I really only am spending 50 to 55 bucks for it, which is not a bad price for a case, especially one that looks as good as this one. That said, if you wanted to save some money, I know that Newegg makes a Rosewill brand case that I believe is 40, that has amazing reviews that people love. There's other cases I've seen that are 30 or even $20. You can save money on a computer case. So if you're really squeezing your budget down and trying to save money, buying a cheaper computer case is one way to do it. That said, I also chose this computer case because it's pretty looking. I think it's cool and I think it's important to have a computer case that you love looking at because honestly, mine's on my desk. I look at mine all the time. So I wanna make sure that there is a pretty looking case that holds all the stuff. So take all that into consideration whenever you're buying your computer case. If you wanna save some money, you can, but if you wanna spend a little bit more money and get something that looks good, that is a great option too. That's about it as far as parts go. And I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, wait a second, Matt, you didn't cover the mouse or the keyboard or the monitor. What about that? Those are important. Well, to be completely honest, because I'm building this computer for my brother, he already has the mouse, keyboard, and monitor from a previous computer build that I did for him years ago. So he's planning on keeping those to save money, which I think is a great choice. But that said, if you are following along with this build guide and you wanna know all of the parts, including mouse, keyboard, monitor, anything like that, I will have links to everything in the description of this video. So if you wanna buy this SSD, well, don't buy this one, buy the faster one, or you wanna buy RAM, or you wanna buy the motherboard, or anything like that, there will be links to everything down in the description, including my favorite mouse, my favorite keyboard, my favorite monitor. So that way, if you are trying to follow along and do this build, you're not gonna be sitting there like, Matt, I really want to, but I only have the box. I don't actually have a monitor to watch things on. I do not wanna leave you high and dry, so do not worry. All of those links will be down there in the description. With all that said, after going over all these parts, telling you what I bought and why, I'm ready to put this computer together. So let's get right into building. It's time to build. 
wife Rachel, here to help. She's gonna be shooting a second angle, getting detail shots, close up, things like that. But let's jump right into it. So first off, let's open up our computer case here. Take your Bayer Grylls certified survival knife. Take it out of its sheath. I recommend always cutting away from you as well. We're gonna pop this guy open here. The extra points if you can kind of cut toward your wife while you're doing it. Extra, she, she'll love that. This is so exciting to me. I love building computers and I don't get to do it often enough. Especially on camera, you guys are getting to experience my joy with me here. So let's get the plastic off there just a little bit. Stand it up straight. Oh. Ooh, that's pretty. Let's do the important thing here first. Remove the plastic covering. It's a favorite part of any unboxing. Oh, it's so beautiful. To open up the side of the computer here, we're gonna have to undo these back screws. We'll undo this screw on the back right here. Here's the other one, and that one's on there tighter. Screwdriver, always beneficial to have when you're building a computer. The good news about computers is that you don't really need a lot of tools. Like, take a screwdriver, and uh, that's about it, honestly, which is great. I should be able to just slide back here and then lift away. And there is the inside of our computer with more plastic to remove. Do you like that? You don't care about it. Okay, great. I love the blue accents on this thing. This looks really pretty. So as you can see here, this is where the motherboard's gonna go. There's good hard drive mounting spots here, it looks like. Power supply is gonna go under this guy. And that's about it. Nothing super crazy. Now, you're probably wondering at this point also, where are all the screws? Where's everything that we actually need to put into this thing? They're actually down here underneath the power supply. So we gotta take off this side here too. Slide back and up and off that side goes. And now we have access to the entire back panel. And as you can see here, here are where the wires are coming in. So these are the wires that are coming from the USB ports up here at the top and from the headphone and microphone jack as well as the power cord and the hard drive activity light. All of those lights and power are gonna be running down through these cords here, also the cords from the fans. They all come together and run down here to the bottom. If you notice here, this is a little box. That doesn't look like it belongs. That's because this box should be our box of screws and other accessories that we need for this computer. They give you zip ties and they give you screws, lots and lots of screws. Instruction manual, which I do not always read instruction manuals. This is in Spanish. That's also in Spanish. Ah, this side, this side helps out, it's good. We can start with either the motherboard installation or the power supply. Either one of those are not gonna be a big deal. First, I'm gonna go ahead and take off all this other wrapping stuff, get all the packaging stuff. As you can see, there's all these cables. Do not be intimidated. They're not that scary. Always have a good like trash box too. The, ca the case box is always a good trash box for things. I say, let's start with the power supply because that's gonna go down here. And then we will install the motherboard. What we need to first consider here is the screws that we're gonna use for the power supply. And the case does include those. In this case, it says that they are the C screws, which are, if we look at the map here, hexagon screws 6-32 by six millimeters. So that should be 6-32 screw hexagon size. Take our box and our knife again. Stay hydrated. Keep everybody hydrated. Everybody's gotta say hydrated when we're building a computer. Cut into your power supply box. Ah, yes, the instruction manual, which for power supplies, not as important. It's pretty straightforward. The power supply here and the cables for the power supply, which if you remember, as I said, this is not a modular power supply, meaning you got a bunch of cables all hanging out of this thing. And of course, the power cord, which we will need, but not yet because we're just putting it in. We don't need to actually plug it in yet. First of all, as you can see, it said to install the power supply upside down, which what's interesting, if you look at on this side, the text is this way and this is facing up because the fan is facing up. But if you flip it, 
Now the fan is facing down, but the text is still there because they make it like that. So nice of them. Thanks, EVGA. Looking at the back of the power supply here, there is one, two, three, four different screw holes. And these screw holes are gonna press up against the back of our case here. And there are four screw holes here, 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 and here that they're going to screw into. I'm going to be a little dangerous here and I'm gonna undo this rat's nest of cables really quickly because I want to have as much maneuverability in this case, but things are about to get pretty darn gnarly. As you can see, these cables get quite long and there's a variety of options. I will cover all of these, do not worry. Wiring is one of the least exciting but most necessary parts of building a computer. Interesting, is that gonna squeeze down in there? Or do I need to move something? Just spent a moment there trying to fit the power supply in this way and like, why is it not fitting? Oh, because this case has the ability for you to mount it from the back. That is super cool and it does say that in the description which I did not actually look at. So that's actually significantly clearer to me. So let's go ahead and undo these four thumb screws on the back. I'm an expert as you can clearly see here. Ha ha, that just comes right off. Now the cool thing is that we're gonna be able to mount this directly to the top of the power supply here using the four screws included in the case. We're gonna turn this guy on its side here a little bit and I'm just gonna start putting screws in to these little holes. As you can see here, it's pretty easy to tell. There are little mounting holes and little guiding areas showing you exactly where to screw things into. So it's really hard to mess this up or screw this up because we're using screws. Rachel doesn't get my humor sometimes. Rachel wants a stool. Rachel now has a stool, she's much more comfortable. At this point, we have the back plate for the case now mounted to the power supply. So we're gonna take our nest of cables here and we're gonna stick them all through here. Do, 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 do. Back up into there. And then we're gonna take our power supply and it's just gonna slide right in there. And then we're going to screw this back in. And now our power supply is mounted in the case and we have even more cables. My goodness, this is, this is looking real rat's nesty over here, but do not freak out. It's gonna be okay. We're gonna make it look pretty at the end. And the other good news is that this is the side of the case that's hidden. So if you look at this side of the case, it looks super clean. Look at that, you can't even tell there's cables. I love that, that's so great. Now that the power supply is installed, it's time to turn our attention to the motherboard. We're gonna take the case here and we're gonna stuff these cables in here so they don't get squished too bad and we're gonna lay it down flat. I've had Rachel come over here a little bit closer because I wanna to explain to you the motherboard mounting system. Now if you look down here in the case, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different mounting screws built into the case that will allow you to mount your motherboard to the case. These screw mounting points are standard for most motherboards, so case manufacturers can just include the screws as they are ready to be mounted. That said, if you're using a different type of motherboard, that's a weird one, you may need to modify some of these screw mounting points. But because this is an ATX case and we're using an ATX motherboard, we should not need to worry about that. So as far as prepping the case goes, we're ready to go. So let me get into the motherboard now. It's another thing to keep in mind whenever you're building a computer. Always make sure that you have enough space. Like, I'm using my whole dining room table here. Lots of room. The more room that you have to kind of expand and let things all sit out where you can see them, the better. Gonna open up the motherboard case here. Ah, the beautiful sound of angels singing. Okay, this is our motherboard. And as you can see, it's in this protective static guard bag because static, real bad. I just stabbed myself to the bottom, ow. Motherboards can be sharp sometimes, so be aware of that. Pull that off, and let's have a look at it here. So, in general, as a rule of thumb, put your motherboard down onto a non-conductive surface so it does not get static electricity. And this is what it looks like. Here are our mounting ports on the back. There's our USB 3.1, USB 3.0, two USB 2.0, HDMI looks like. There is sound card. Here's where the graphics card's gonna go, here's where the processor goes, here's where the memory goes. Once you understand it, it's not that intimidating. Also, the main thing I want you to focus on are the mounting screws. Namely, there's a screw mounting point here, 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 
here, here, here, lots of mounting points because they do not want your motherboard to be bouncing around whenever you're moving your computer or something like that. This needs to be very securely mounted. That's why there's so many mounting points. Let's look at our paperwork here. Motherboard installation. So it is saying that the screws I need to use to install the motherboard are the D screws. So if we pull over our paper here, D is 6-32 by 5 millimeter. As a precautionary measure, anytime you're working with power circuit boards, I should have done this earlier, always make sure that you are grounding yourself. So find a piece of metal, I'm gonna go find one over here, touch it, make sure that you don't have any static electricity built up so you don't accidentally zap your board and end up breaking everything. Now before we start installing the motherboard, let's open up the box here and see what other goodies we got because there's always goodies hidden underneath. In this case, we have the back mounting plate, which is very important. That is gonna provide a dust protective guard that's gonna go between the IO ports and the back of the case. I have installed, I believe, three computers, made it through the entire installation process and realized that I forgot to do this and had to redo it. So make sure you remember to do that. There's a bag with some tiny little screws in it. Don't know what those are for yet. More SATA cables, more zip ties, always important. <gasps> stickers. This is why you really buy a computer and build it yourself for the stickers. Lastly, we have a, is this a coaster? Here is the driver support CD, which I recommend completely ignoring and never using. Download your drivers new from the manufacturer's website. And here's our user guide, which we will pay attention to later, namely because it has the wiring diagram that we're gonna need for whenever we are wiring up the motherboard. We do not need that yet though, do not worry. Let's focus on getting this motherboard into the case. First of all, let's open up our little guard here. I know this thing has a specific name for it. I don't remember it off the top of my head right now. I'm sorry. I'm sure there's nerdy people yelling at me right now. Nice little cover here. And if you look here, it's gonna go right here onto that like so. But before we do that, let's take it down here and let's go ahead and put it into the case. So we're just gonna line it up here and it should, if you push a little hard on it, snap right into place. So now our little guard is there and ready to accept the motherboard. It's a little padded on the motherboard side and I've had issues before where you really have to press hard on the motherboard to get it up against it. So the rule that I follow whenever I'm installing the motherboard is don't be afraid to get a little rough. It can handle it. Motherboards are quite strong and sturdy, so you shouldn't need to stress too much about that. Now let's install this thing. So we're gonna lower it on down here into the case, and you're like, Matt, that's not lined up at all. Oh my gosh, don't stress about it, it's fine. Let's line up all the ports here, and you're gonna be able to see on this side. So that's lined up there. And then what we need to do is we're gonna have to press it up against it pretty tight, but now it's lining up with our screw holes, and that's looking really good. All right, let's get our 6-32 screw flat screws out from the case bag here. And we're gonna take these out one at a time so I do not lose them, because I've done that before. We're gonna take our screwdriver here, and we're gonna start installing these screws. So we'll go down here to one, and just start screwing it in. Take out our next screw here. We're gonna be doing this one, two, three, four, five, six, six more times, seven more times, eight, I don't know. We got a lot here. Basically, if there's a screw hole, you need to use it. Other tip for you guys, aside from the screwdriver that you're gonna need for installation, I always recommend having a flashlight because if you only knew the amount of times that I've mounted something and then realized that I dropped a screw in the process and then I had to dig it out, it's a pain. So make sure you have a flashlight too. If the motherboard makes any sort of cracking sounds or crunching sounds or anything weird, do not be alarmed. It's not breaking. Well, it's most likely not breaking. I've never had it break and I've heard some weird sounds from motherboards before. So just continue installation and hope that whenever you hit the power button, it turns on. So far, Every time I've turned on the power button after building a computer, it's turned on. Except for one time whenever I didn't actually have the cord plugged in. That was funny. And with that, the motherboard is now installed. All the screws are down. And we're now ready to either tackle the graphics card or the CPU or the memory or anything else. I'm probably going to start with the CPU, though. Now that the motherboard is installed, let's move on and install the CPU. Going to take our Ryzen CPU box. We're going to cut the big sticker 
Dun, 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 now it's been opened, they can prove it. And this should be both the CPU, which is here, right, the CPU, ooh, it comes with a sticker too. That's what's really important. And there is the cooler. Let's work on the CPU first. So, gonna open up the box here. CPUs are thankfully one of the easiest things to install. Ta there it is. And they even make it so you can grab it on the sides. So easy. So, here is the Ryzen CPU, the main brain of the entire computer. And what I want you to focus on is that it's square and there is a little triangle in this corner. And if you look at the motherboard next, there is actually gonna be a little triangle on it as well, so you can know which way to line it up because there are all these little pins on the bottom of the CPU and you do not want to bend any of these because then you have a dead CPU and you gotta buy a new one, which sucks. So we're gonna go over here and we're gonna press down on this little guy and bring up this lever here, which is our mounting lever for the CPU. And we're gonna look down here at it very closely. You find the triangle. Looking at the little triangle on the CPU here and looking at the CPU mounting slot, it was hard to find the triangle. It was actually quite difficult to see because it was the same color. But the triangle is in this corner. So we're gonna line up the triangle here with that triangle. And we're gonna lower the CPU down into place. And as you can see, it sits there quite snugly. So that's now on. And now we're going to lower down our handle and it is now locked in place. Simple as that, this CPU is installed. We're making great progress in this computer build, I gotta say. Now it's time to install the CPU cooler, which is gonna go on top of the CPU and keep it from getting boiling hot whenever it is rendering or doing anything else that's under a high load such as gaming, etc. This is the base of it. This is where the CPU is going to touch and there will be a fan blowing the air off the top of it. The main thing that I want you to notice here is that there is a shiny gray material on the bottom of the CPU cooler. That is the thermal paste that is pre-installed on this cooler. So if you buy an aftermarket cooler, sometimes the coolers will not include thermal paste, and that is something that you definitely need to have on your cooler. In this case, we don't have to worry about that. So we are now gonna look down here at the motherboard and figure out exactly how we mount this cooler. In this case, this cooler has four mounting screws. So looking here at the motherboard, this motherboard comes with these two plastic mounts installed for a different kind of cooler. Because we are not using that cooler, we're going to uninstall these two plastic mounts here and we're going to screw the cooler directly onto the motherboard. So now that I've undone these four mounting screws, there's actually a metal plate that you just heard smash down onto the table below because those screws are not holding it in place. So what we're gonna have to do is get a little creative here and I actually may need to have Rachel help me out with this to put the plate back on. Straighten the computer back up here and here is the mounting plate that came off the bottom. We're gonna slide the mounting plate back into the holes where it was, and that will just hold right there, which is great. And next, we are going to... Everything's fine, do not be alarmed. I'm actually gonna face things around this way more so you can see what I'm doing while Rachel holds the back plate. Now, we're going to install the CPU cooler and it has four thumb screws around it which are gonna match up with these screw mounting holes. Very, very helpful. So we're gonna just take the CPU cooler and we're gonna line it up and then we're gonna mash it down and we're gonna try to not lift it up again so that we do not deal with any sort of sliding around of the CPU paste, which I don't think there's gonna be. Everything's lined up here. There we go, that's lined up. And we're gonna start screwing it in. Building a computer with Matt. What an exciting way to spend your day. Rachel's excited about it, right? You're bored, how can you be bored installing a computer? It's so much fun. And now the cooler is pressed firmly onto the CPU and you want 
that to be as tight as possible up against it because that's gonna result in better heat dissipation and your computer is gonna run cooler. Now that the CPU cooler is installed, we need to run the power cable for the CPU cooler right here. And the good thing is that everything on the motherboard is labeled. And if you're looking at it from far off, it can kind of look like Greek because it's a lot of tiny lettering. But if you look close and take your time, you'll be like, oh, that says CPU fan. Okay, cool. And that's how you know to, where to plug in your CPU cooler fan is it will say CPU fan. So if we look up here on the motherboard, up here in this top right corner, you can see it says CPU fan and there's a little arrow pointing to this set of four pins. And if you look at the mount at the bottom of the cooler here, it has four pinholes. So this is actually very simple. We're just gonna line up the holes with the plastic here and we're going to slide it down on. And we're done. Now the CPU cooler, fan, and CPU are installed, and we are ready to move on to the next thing. Next, let's install the M.2 SSD. So we're gonna slide the computer over here, and I'm gonna get out the motherboard box here again, because in it, there is a tiny little bag with some tiny, tiny, tiny little screws. And you were like, Matt, what is the point of these screws? I believe that these screws are the screws we're gonna to use to mount the M.2 SSD to the motherboard. With this screw out of the motherboard box, we're gonna put that back down, and we're gonna go over here to our Samsung VNAND 850 EVO M.2 drive, which is gonna be the hard drive that I'm gonna install all of the operating system onto, plus any video editing programs that my brother wants to use, and games. I'm gonna pull out the box here, and there, is the hard drive. Look at it, it's so tiny. It's ridiculous. Now, one of the cons of this hard drive that I read about is that it actually does not come with a mounting screw that you can use to mount it to the motherboard, which is why I have some screws here that I'm going to attempt to use to see if I can mount this to the motherboard. It should not be a huge issue. Screws are screws, not a huge deal. We're gonna pop up here, and there is the SSD, look at that thing, it's so tiny. Now the cool thing about M.2 SSDs is that they are very easy to install. Unlike a traditional SATA drive, you don't have to plug in the drive and run the power cable and run the SATA cable. Literally, it all is handled in this little device whenever you plug it into the motherboard. So we're gonna go in here and look at the motherboard. It has this little M.2 mounting point here and we're gonna take it and we're gonna take it right down here. There we go right into there, and we just slide it in. And now it's kind of sticking up because it needs a screw to screw it down. Double checking the motherboard instruction manual, this is the M.2 screw that we're gonna need to mount this screw to the motherboard. So even though Samsung did not include a screw, Asus did with their motherboard, thank God. So now we take this oh so tiny screw, and we're gonna screw this tiny little screw into the M.2 slot. And that is there now, holding it in place. With the M.2 drive installed, we still have the RAM and the graphics card. And I'm gonna save the graphics card to last because it's gonna be a lot of fun. But let's focus on the RAM right now, which is still fun, but not quite as fun. RAM's really simple. Open up the very easy to open container. I really like how simple that is. And the main thing you wanna notice here is that it comes with a sticker. Everything comes with a sticker whenever you build your own computer and it's the best thing ever. So I have this RAM here and before I install it, I need to check the instruction manual because in the instruction manual for every motherboard, they will detail the slots that you're supposed to install the RAM into. In this case, I know that it's probably not gonna be slots right next to each other. They're gonna want me to install it into slots that are at least one apart, I would guess. Here we go, system memory. So because we are using two sticks of memory, it's saying to install one into DIMM A2 and one into B2. We can see that we need to install into this slot and this slot are two sticks of RAM. Very, very good. Good work, right? If you look down here at the RAM slots, there are little plastic guards and we can push back on the top part of these guards here so that it is now ready for me to install the RAM. The next thing you wanna do is you wanna look at your RAM and find the little gap because sometimes it'll be longer on one side or the other and the gap will be a little off center. In this case, the gap looks like it is slightly further down. We're gonna line up our RAM right here into slot two 
and we're going to eyeball it here and say that looks right. Line it up into the holes. Mash down solidly to the point that you're afraid you're going to break it and the RAM will be properly mounted in this plastic connector here will then slide up against the RAM. If you ever need to uninstall it, you can press up on this little plastic and it will push the RAM up, enabling you to uninstall it. But in our case, this RAM looks good. It's installed properly. Let's do the other stick. Okay, RAM stick number two, same way. We're gonna push back on the plastic, line up the holes, line up the holes, and we're going to press down. Gonna make a slight crunching sound and then the RAM is installed. Ta-da, the RAM is now ready, and the last thing we have to do is install the graphics card, which we're gonna do right now. Let's look at the graphics card. The GTX 1060, six gigabytes of VRAM. This thing, killer, man, totally killer. Let's open up this box here, cutting away from yourself at all times and toward your wife. That direction, perfect. Open up the box here. And we're going to start sliding out the graphics card. Notice that much like the motherboard, it comes in an electrostatic bag. So fancy. Do not enter without proper electrostatic safety equipment. Really? I got hands. Can't, don't know what to tell you. Pull this out here. Oh, this is an interesting card. And we're going to reach in and pull out, carefully, carefully gonna pull out here, the graphics card. Ooh, that's pretty, that's real pretty. GTX 1060, remove protective film before use. Yes, I will, I love doing that. I'm gonna pull off protective film. Ooh, yeah, that's pretty. So as you can see, here is the graphics card. Here is the mounting pins that we're going to use to mount it to the motherboard. Here is the, where we're gonna be attaching the power. We do not need to mess with any of the back of this card. We've already taken off the protective covering so we can put the card down right here and not worry about it for a second because we need to prepare our case to accept the card. So back here on the back of the case, you'll notice that we have all of these different screw holes and we can look here into the case and match up and say, okay, how many of these protective backings do we need to remove? So if I hold the card up here and look, it appears I'm gonna remove this one and this one because this is a double width card, so it takes up two spaces. So I'm gonna insert our screwdriver into here, remove this one and the one right below it. And we are now ready to install this graphics card. So we're gonna lay the case back down here so we can access the motherboard easily. We're gonna grab our graphics card, and much like the RAM, this is an incredibly simple process. You have your metal pins here, and you have a slot that precisely matches up with the metal pins. Whenever you are installing, you want to make sure that you are using the highest up one. That is usually the one that you want to use whenever you are installing a graphics card, because that is as close to the CPU as possible. And whenever you're dealing with a motherboard and latencies of nanoseconds, it really does make a difference whenever your graphics card is this close or this close. It, does, it's crazy. These other expansion slots are gonna be useful if say we want to install another PCIe SSD or other accessories, but for now, we're just gonna install the graphics card. Turns out I actually need to remove this entire plate here because it is impeding the way that the graphics card mounts. Third try is the charm for the graphics card, I believe. Gonna line up the holes there, press down, and it's installed. Ta-da, we did it. Now, with the graphics card installed, we need to screw it down so that it will stay put. There are these screw holes from the case that we need to screw back in here. And sometimes computer cases can be a little weird with the metal where you kind of have to press in like I'm having to do to fit the screws back into it. That can be just a thing with the design tolerances of the case, etc. Something for you to be aware of whenever you're installing your graphics cards. Sometimes you may have to finagle things a little bit to make them fit. It's gonna require enough pressure that you may think you're hurting things, but you're not. Do not worry. It's time to wire this beast. So we're gonna tilt it up here onto its side so you can see the back of it here. And as you can see, here are all of our wires that I tried to hide. Remember that? I was like, let's not deal with this right now. We have to deal with it now. I'm sorry, this is how it's gonna be. Let's pull all this out so we can look at it. And let's pull all these out so we can look at them. 
Do not be intimidated by what you see here. I realize it's a little terrifying, but the good news is that the majority of these we are not going to use. We're only gonna use a few of them. So first up, let's start with the basics by plugging in the main power for the motherboard. So if you dig through all of your cables here, you're gonna find there's one cable that's really, really big. It's got a massive amount of connectors here attached to it. It's all in one. It even has a little side connector thing. This is your main motherboard power cable. I believe it's called the ATX cable. And so we're gonna want to start handling our cable management by running this cable first. And we're going to take it and we're gonna insert it through this part of the case. And whenever I do that and insert it through this part of the case, it's going to appear over here. And so the cool thing about this case is that it has this blue metal bar here that's protecting your cables from being visible. So with this cable here, like so, we're gonna line up our ports here. And as you can see, the cool thing is that these little connectors are all the same shape as these connectors. So it's really hard to screw this up. So we're gonna take our cables here and we're going to insert them in all the way and that's gonna click down. And then we have this extra little four prong here. We're gonna plug that in to the end here as well. Don't be afraid to press hard. The motherboard's gonna flex a little bit, but don't worry about it. Now that we have that installed, we can go back here and we can start routing these cables and bring it back down here so that the cables are starting to look a little neater. Now you can't see anything of the cable except for the connector cables here, which I wish were a different color. This is definitely indicating that we have a cheaper power supply, but otherwise that looks really good. Now let's consult our motherboard manual here that I was looking at because it says we not only need to connect the ATX power connection, but we also need to connect the eight pin power plug, which you're like, Matt, eight pin power plug, what's that? If you look up here on the motherboard, it's really dark, there is another eight pin power plug up here at the top that we need to plug into as well. On the back of the computer here, we're gonna go through all of our cables here again. Don't need that one, don't need that one, don't need that one. Like I said, a lot of these we do not have to really worry about, which is really good. The one that we want to pay attention to is this guy right here. It's just a standalone eight pin power connector. How can you tell it's eight pins? Because there is eight connectors on the back of it, so it's eight pin. This one here says CPU, CPU, because this is the connector that's gonna give the CPU power. The big connector we did gave the motherboard power, this pin is gonna power our Ryzen CPU. So in that case, let's try running this cable and I'm trying to make this as neat as possible as I go. There's also a point where modular cables will be better, but unfortunately we don't have that. So we're gonna run this cable right here and we're gonna have it just run up along the side here and we're gonna run it through this little hole up here in the top. Okay, so we're gonna run this cable through here like so, and we still have some room, which is good. And we're gonna line up our pins here with it and we're going to simply plug it in. Now cables can be a little tough. They can be a little hard, a little difficult to maneuver, but this is a situation where you just kinda gotta manhandle them into position as it were. There we go. Now our CPU has power. So the motherboard has power here, the CPU has power here, and because we are running our cables around the back of the computer, this still looks really clean. Next, we need to power our graphics card. So rotating this around here, I'm gonna look through all of my lovely connection to cables and the screwdriver that just fell into my shoe, kid you not, just happened. We're gonna look for a six pin power connector cable because that is what we're gonna use to power the graphics card. So right here, I have this cable, and as you can see, it actually has an eight pin connector here and an eight pin connector here. And it's actually labeled PCIe, which means that it is made for PCIe power, namely graphics cards. So we're going to take this cable here and I'm gonna run it up underneath. And you may say, I'm like, Matt, what are you doing with this thing? Where are you hiding this thing? Hold on and watch this little hole right here because it's about to come out. So this hole is very helpful because this is the one hole where you're gonna have cables visible. The problem is that this cable is a little too short. So because I bought a cheaper power supply, we're gonna have this connector visible whenever I plug in this thing. I wish it wasn't so, it's not pretty, but I really don't have another option for this. So we're gonna go ahead 
and plug in this power here and then I'm gonna see if I can find a way to hide this more later. So PCIe six pin power plugs into the graphics card right there and that is now good to go. I will run this cable down so that way it is mostly hidden aside from this guy right here, nothing that I can do about that. But now that flows down nicely into the case. Now with the graphics card powered, the motherboard powered and the CPU powered, we are now ready to power all the other accessories in the case. Namely this fan, this fan, the hard drive activity light, the headphone jack, the microphone jack, the two USB 3.0 ports and the power button that are on the case. So if I flip all this back around over here, you're gonna see this whole mess of cables here and these are the ones that we need to focus on. Let's focus on the simpler things first here. Let me make sense of all this here for you. This cable right here is the cable that connects to the case fans. You can tell because it's kind of this weird big plastic shape. I believe this is called a Molex connector and this is gonna plug directly into the power supply and it is how your case fans receive power. So if we look through here, through all of our other lovely cables that we have here, you're gonna find a cable here and it has a Molex connector on the back of it, as you can see. It doesn't really matter where you plug this into as long as it's plugged into a Molex connector and this is very simple to do because this connector is the same shape as this connector and they will just easily snap together like so. Now they're connected. Please be aware that Molex connectors are one of the jankiest connectors on any computer and I'm not a huge fan of them because they never feel like they're super solid. It's kind of like this weird metal on metal touch. I'm not a huge fan, but that said, our fans are now connected and ready for power and Later on, once I'm done connecting this other stuff, I will hide all this up under here so that it's not visible and it looks better cable managed than it currently is because this is kind of a nightmare right now. Other things that we need to consider here. These are the other cables that are running out of the case. Thankfully, all of them are labeled. If you look at the tiny lettering here, these cables are honestly horrible. I'm not a huge fan of how they do this either. This is the power switch cable. This is the power LED light. This is the other connector for the power LED lights. There's a positive and a negative that goes with the power switch. We also have an HDD LED, which is the hard disk activity light that blinks whenever it tells you the hard disk is active. We'll want to plug that in too. This looks to be the audio connector. So if you want to run your headphones or your microphone, it's going to run through this cable to the motherboard. Lastly, we have the USB 3.0 connector, which is easy to tell because it's the USB 3.0 blue. Thankfully, they make it pretty easy to identify. So we will start with the USB 3.0 connector. There is not a required order to go in to plug all this stuff in, it just needs to be plugged in. So do not stress if you're like, oh man, I didn't do it in the right order. Don't worry about that. It's not a huge deal. We will just start with the easiest and go up to the hardest from there. Anytime you're connecting any of these cables, it's important to check your motherboard manual because it's gonna show you exactly where to plug them in. So do not stress if you're like, man, it's all confusing. Read the manual, it will tell you what to do. In this case, it is telling me exactly where the USB 3.0 connector is. So we are going to flip the case around so you can see it and then I'm gonna install this very quickly and easily, I hope. With the case now flipped around, I'm gonna take this USB 3.0 cable and all I'm gonna do is route it around right here so it's poking out and you can see it. Ta-da! It's right here. By checking the motherboard manual, it's telling me that the USB 3.0 connector is actually right here. And if you look, it says USB 3 in very tiny lettering. We're gonna take our USB 3.0 cable here and the good thing about this cable is it actually has a little plastic point on this side. And this plastic point matches up with the gap right here on this connector. So there's really only one way to do it and you don't have to worry about bending pins or anything like that. So I'm gonna point it right here and I'm going to plug it in. And now our USB 3.0 cables are connected. So whenever we are plugging in peripherals to the top up here, it's now going to have power and actually be able to do that. Up next, we need to connect our audio cable, which is the cable that's gonna provide the power for the headphones and the microphone. So looking here through the cables, this says HD audio, so that is our cable. And if we look at the manual, it is saying the front panel audio connector AAFP. So we're gonna look for an AAFP on the motherboard in the bottom left corner, which the manual says that's where it is located. I'm gonna run the audio cable down and through the bottom down here because there's a nice little opening down here at the bottom of the motherboard. So all that I've done at this point is string it from the back 
through the front right here and it's looking good. So if you look down here in the bottom left corner, there is a set of pins here and underneath it says AAFP, which tells us that is where we need to plug in this cable. If you look closely, you'll also notice that there are one, two, three, four, five pins on the bottom and only four pins on the top with a gap between the third and the fifth pin. And if you look down here on the actual connector on the motherboard, there is a gap there as well. So all that we need to do is line up these pins together and plug it in. So I'm going to gently, ever so gently with this sort of stuff because it is tiny little metal pieces that could bend easily. We're going to press that in. And now, the audio is connected. And we now have headphone and microphone jack for the front of the case. Now we don't want this cable hanging out around here, so I'm gonna pull this cable back for the most part. So that way it is just the connector there and that's looking a lot cleaner overall. You could build a computer after this, Rachel. I'm so proud of you. Last two cables here. We're almost done. It's so exciting. We have the power switch and power LED cable and we have the hard disk activity cable. And both of these are gonna be running around much like the audio cable was to the motherboard. What the manual is telling me is that the power connection cables are gonna be at the bottom right hand corner of the motherboard. So I have a couple options here. I can either run these cables through the side to this connection or I can run them up from the bottom to this connection. The versatility is nice because it really gives me options if I'm doing proper cable routing and management. In this case, I just want to get these things connected and because I don't have a ton of cables running, it's not going to be a big issue regardless of which way I'm going to do it. So I'm not going to worry about that. What I am going to worry about is getting these things plugged in properly because they are, as I've said before, very tiny. So I'm going to take these cables and I'm going to run them through the side right here. So you're going to see them start poking out here easily visible. There is a little piece of text that says panel, which indicates that it's for the front panel. And underneath, there is a lot of very, very tiny lettering that says things like HDD, LED, and a lot of other things quite difficult to see. So sometimes I feel like you need a magnifying glass to get all this stuff plugged in properly. What we're going to do now is I'm going to actually take the case here. And now that I have these cables running through it, I'm going to lay the case down on its back. Even though it's kind of crushing a few of the cables, it's not a big deal. It'll be fine. The case itself isn't heavy enough. And I'm going to route these cables properly. This part may freak you out because you're going to have to connect tiny little pins of metal into these tiny little holes on these cables. But do not worry. It is very hard to screw this up. I have misplugged it before and the only thing that happened was that I think that my power light was flashing whenever my hard disk activity light was supposed to be flashing. Let's do the hard disk activity light first. And the good news is that the manual actually has a diagram as well that has bigger font if you want to be able to read it in there. So this is telling me that the hard disk activity LED is going to be at the bottom left corner with the positive is in the left pin and the negative in the right pin. So, thankfully, everything is labeled here. So I can look at this hard disk activity LED. Looking at the back of it here with the little arrow, I think the arrow probably means positive. So we're going to take the hard disk activity LED cable and I'm gonna run it down here to these tiny, tiny little pins. This is the part of computer building that feels like surgery and I'm gonna line it up, and I'm gonna slide it down. Ta-da, okay, our hard disk activity LEDs are connected. If, whenever I turn it on, the hard disk activity light is blinking, hey, that means we did it right. If it's not blinking, it means I did it wrong, but I think we're okay. Last thing, we're to the last thing, guys, we're almost there, I'm so excited. We have the power switch and the power LEDs. So looking at the manual here again, it's telling me that the power LED, so the two little individual cables are at the top left, with the positive at the left, the negative at the right, and then there is the power switch next to it. Okay, I think I can do this here. Okay, power LED switch positive is plugged in. I'm gonna plug in the negative now. I realize that Rachel's trying to film this and it's impossible because I got my big meaty hands in the way. Lastly, we're gonna connect the power LEDs 
And there we go. Congratulations, you have now wired your computer. At this point, we're now ready to power this guy on and see if it works. So you're noticing all these horrible cables that are laying out here. You're noticing the front doesn't look good. There's a lot of things that we can do to make this case look prettier. Namely, proper cable management would be really huge. Doing things to improve the aesthetic look of the case, hiding a lot of the cables behind this back shroud. It's gonna look really good once I do that. But for now, I wanna make sure that it actually works. There's no point to me properly routing all the cables, making it look all pretty, and then only to plug it in and realize it doesn't turn on. So at this point, we're gonna have the moment of truth. We're gonna hit the power button and we're gonna see if it works. I have to find the power cord first. Mr. Power cord is not super long here, so what I'm gonna do, is so I'm gonna cannibalize this light over here that I'm using. Not super dark, that's good. And now I wanna plug this power cord into the cable here. So that way we can tell if it's actually gonna power on. So I'm gonna plug this guy into the back here. Ta-da! And we're gonna run the cable down here to the power plug. Moment of truth, not really. Plugging this in doesn't do anything because I haven't put the switch on the back here yet. So. With that now connected, we are now ready to turn on the power for the motherboard. I'm gonna start by flipping this switch here. <gasps> oh, it lit up a little bit. What, look at that. Oh man, that's so cool. It's got like RGB going and all. I didn't know it was gonna be that pretty. I gotta say this Asus Aura stuff that they're doing for their motherboards looks sick. That is so cool. But the computer's not on yet. That is literally just the off waiting to be turned on moment. So I'm gonna hit the power button here and we're gonna see what happens. Do you wanna do a countdown? I don't know. Three, two, one. <gasps> it's spinning the fans! Okay, that fan is spinning, that fan is spinning. This light is solid, it is blinking. Now it is to orange. This is spinning, that is on. It turned on! and nothing exploded, there was no smoke. I'm feeling really good about this, and this is looking really, really awesome. That said, we don't have a monitor plugged in, we don't have a keyboard or a mouse plugged in, we don't have anything to actually tell if it's actually working. I know it's lit up, I know it's turned on, so that's good, that means that we didn't break anything, but as far as knowing if it is going to be ready to install the operating system and do things like that, I don't know if it's ready for that yet. So. Next step is gonna to be to turn this thing off, eat some dinner, let's be honest here, and then I'm gonna go through and connect everything up into the computer and install an operating system on it. Also, I'm gonna clean up this horrible cable rat's nest in the back. I'm gonna to try to make this computer look as pretty as possible, even with this little guy dangling here, I know. And I think we'll be pretty good at that point. Welcome to the next day. This computer is working flawlessly and it started up the first time with no issues. I'm so happy. That's the first time I've ever done that and actually had it work. So I'm very glad that it was on camera whenever that happened. I'm gonna be benchmarking this computer, doing some video editing, video rendering, and to be honest here, completely playing games. And I'm gonna be posting the results of those benchmarks to my Facebook page. So if you want to see those, you can check out my Facebook page. It is down in the description of this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this video has been helpful to you and given you some great insight into how you can build your own video editing PC. And now I have a question for you. If this video was helpful to you in any way, if you enjoyed watching me put together a computer. If you'd like to see more videos about computer builds in the future, more videos about budget video editing builds, high powered video editing builds, anything else video editing and computer related, could you please leave me a comment letting me know if this was helpful, what you would like to see in the future, anything else like that. I would love it if you could comment and let me know because I'm considering doing more videos like this in the future. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave one below or get in touch with me through my website, whoismat.com. It is also a massive help to me if you would consider liking this video and subscribing if you wanna see more computer stuff or camera stuff or filmmaking stuff in the future. I also have an Instagram at whoismat and a Facebook page if you wanna follow me. I post news and stuff like that. I will link to that down in the description of this video. I'm also offering consulting, so if you wanna talk about computer builds or filmmaking or anything else, you can sign up for that at whoismat.com slash consulting. Consulting. I also have a wedding film production company, FilmStrong Productions, that you can check out at filmstrong.com. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.